Hi, welcome to another edition of Fight for Justice. We hope you will enjoy these shows. And, and at the outset, I want to tell you what we're going to be doing next week and the week after, probably. We're going to do a special series on the laws that have been passed by legislatures around the country to protect sporting officials. I've got a friend who officiates some high school games, and he, he brought that idea to me, so we've researched it. And we're going to have some special guests next week on sporting events, and we hope that you will join us. Uh, this show is broadcast generally at 9.30 on Wednesday nights, and at other times throughout the week, you have to check your listings to find it. I think it's about six times a week you have a chance to see it again. And today's topic is going to be workmen's compensation laws in Alabama. Uh, and we're going to talk about who's covered, who's not, what you can receive out of that sort of uh, claim if you have one. And I have a special guest today, Pat Hughes, who is an attorney here in Anniston. And sometimes Pat and I have been on the same side and sometimes we've been on the other side. And as a lot of us get asked a lot of time, how can you go out and have lunch with a guy you just battle with? Well, that's just part of the nature of the profession. We can do that. We learn to respect each other and uh, accommodate them. So, Pat, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. And I uh, hope that this will, I know it's going to be informative today. Today's topic is workman's compensation, as we were saying. <clears throat> and the reason is Pat spends a lot of his practice in the area of workman's compensation claims. We don't do as much as he does, but uh, I have wanted somebody other than me talking about this today, and I thank you for coming. First of all, um, we put up some information about you on the screen earlier to let them know that you're an Alabama graduate. Uh, law school Alabama graduate. He's been an active uh, coach in various sports, basketball and some others, and has had some successful uh, teams around here. But anyway, today we're going to talk about workman's comp. And uh, Pat, can you tell us generally who's covered by workman's comp in the state? In Alabama, every employee that works for an employer that has over five employees is covered. So that, that covers almost every every employee in the state. You got to be pretty small not to have work, yeah, not have to, to be, be required. If, if you don't have five employees, you're not, you don't have to, you're not required to get workers' compensation insurance, but everybody that has over five employees is required to get workers' compensation. Oh, wait, what about the employer who's got three employees? Can he cover it? Can he, can he buy that coverage? Or he can, he? and I would recommend he do that because otherwise he's going to be He's going he's gonna to be a, naked out there, isn't he? Yeah, he's going to be yeah. naked. So I would recommend every employee employer get workers' comp insurance. All right, let's talk about the type of claims or the things that happen that result or can result in a workman's compensation claim. You know, what has to happen for there to be a claim on a workman's compensation? Well, you have to have an on-the-job accident. And on-the-job accident could be where you're lifting a... Uh, big barrel of mineral spirits or you're lifting a... a, lifting a um, a uh, piece of wood or walking across the floor and tripping or something like that. Any, anything like that that occurred on the job would be covered. Now an idiopathic fall where you're just walking across the floor and you just all of a sudden fall is not going to be covered. There's a new case that just came out within the last two years and the, the trial court found that to be covered but the Supreme Court said no, that that is not covered anymore. Okay, let's interject a, a side street on that. If the trial court has the duty to decide if the injury is covered. Isn't that the threshold question? That's correct. And if the employer's insurance company doesn't agree with that, they can appeal that to the state Supreme Court and have them decide that issue. Well, the, the appeals process would be either one, whoever lost the case at trial. In a workers' comp case, the case is tried before a, a judge and not a jury. So. If you, if you don't like the verdict that you receive at trial, you, can, you would then appeal it to the Court of Civil Appeals. If you don't like that verdict, then you would appeal it to the Supreme Court. So there's a, kind of a two-tier appeal process. And there's no jury along any of that, of course. No jury. So, now, if you, <clears throat> there is one, one way you can get a jury if you believe that the employee did not follow safety regulations. There is a piece, parcel in the, um, in the, in the code that allows the, the employer to ask for a jury trial. But that's the only time you can ask for one. By the way, you, were, you and I were talking before we went on camera. Tell, the, tell our audience something about the history of workman's compensation laws in this state. I think well, it's very, I think it's very interesting because Minnesota was the first state to get workers' comp insurance, to, to, to order or to acquire every, every employer to get workers' comp insurance. We were right after that. So we were at the forefront back in the 1920s 
of getting workers' comp insurance in this country. And it was very liberally, uh, very liberal um, act. And if you'll see that in the in and, the and by the word liberal, you mean you don't mean politically. You're talking about no, who's covered. That's right. What kind of claims and you can bring? It, the act is in in this in the cases that construe the act. It'll say the act is to be liberally construed in favor of the employee. So they got an advantage. Yes, they do. Yeah. Now there's also a federal law too, Federal Employers Liability Act, which is the same thing. And I remember I, just a diversion. I had a case. I used to clerk on the Alabama Supreme Court, and we had one case come down where an engineer walking around a tr train, the, the uh, engine, and he had a pistol in his pocket, and it fell on the floor and shot him. And he got benefits because of that under the federal law. But um, the claim against an employer in this state, can you sue them directly? Can you sue your employer for injuries? Yes. Uh, outside, I mean, but you have to do it in the workman's compensation. Yes, yeah, it's, it's an exclusive right. You can't. To, when you get hurt on the job, you don't have to prove negligence. You just have to prove that your injury occurred while performing your job. You don't have to prove anybody's at fault. No, okay. you don't have to prove yeah. your, the, the employer's at fault. Okay, and then once that, once that occurs on the job, what's the employer's first, employee's rather, first responsibility? What's he got to do? Well, when you get hurt on the job, you are required to give notice to the employee, I mean, to the employer. And you can't say something like this, my back is hurting. That's not good enough notice. That's not proper notice. You need to say, I got hurt doing a specific thing on the job. Under the code, it says, in the Workers' Comp Act, it says that you're supposed to give written notice within five days, but the courts have said no. You don't need to follow that. You, but you do have to give oral notice within 90 days. If you miss that notice requirement, who, then you're, who then do you're give barred. The, who do you give the notice to? I recommend to my clients that they give notice to either their supervisor, their uh, human resources director, or even the, the owner of the company, their boss, anybody like that in a supervisory capacity you can give notice to. Yeah, but not to your fellow employee. No, that's not good enough. <clears throat> and do you recommend they put that in writing or just verbal notice? Verbal is fine. Yeah. But if my client has come to me and the company does not recognize that, that it's a worker's comp injury, I will then recommend that they give written notice to the company okay. and so we got they can about hand ten, deliver it. 10 more seconds in this phase, so we'll continue our discussion shortly. Keep, stay tuned and we'll get into it in much more detail. See you in a few minutes. Okay, welcome to our second segment of the Fight for Justice show tonight. Uh, we're glad you're with us. Tonight's topic is workman compensation. And we're going to continue our discussion about workman's comp. And if you have a question, you're welcome to call either me or my guest, and we'll try to answer it. Our guest tonight is Pat Hughes, who's an attorney here in Anniston, somebody I've known for probably 30 years. And we have been friends for 30 years, despite the fact sometimes we might square off. But that's the way lawyers work. Uh, we've been talking about notice requirements and who has to pay and what's covered. A little bit about workman's comp cases your employers. In the second segment, we're going to talk about who pays the bills that you, if you're hurt on the job. Pat, welcome to the second segment. Glad to be here. And let's talk again. Let's carry on this discussion about um, when you're hurt on the job, what does the employer have to pay for? When you're hurt on the job, the employer has to pay all medical costs that, that you incur um, when you're hurt. So we talked about notice. When you go to your employer and you give notice, they should take you directly to the emergency room, whatever doctor that you're being treated by. So normally you go to the emergency room, if you need further treatment, say you hurt your back, they will, they will send you to an orthopedic or a neurosurgeon. They pay all the medical costs. And when you are hurt on the job, they are required to pay all medical costs for the duration of your life. So if you live to be 85, they have to pay that the rest of your life. You have a right if you do not like your treating physician, say an orthopedic surgeon, neurosurgeon, to ask for a list of four, and that specialty that your treating physician is in. So if you don't like your doctor, you ask for a list of four. They then give you a list of four, and you choose that doctor. Once you make that choice, that doctor is your doctor for the rest of your life. The only, the, only, the only difference, the only thing you can change from that is, let's say that 
you're seeing a non-surgical doctor, and that doctor, and you've chosen him from a list of four. If that doctor recommends you have surgery, you can then ask for a new list of four surgeons to treat you, but that's the only time you can have a second list of four. Usually it's only one. So once you make that list, I mean, you request that list, once you choose from that list, you're stuck with that doctor. Okay, and that's at the initial phase, the beginning of the case. That's correct. And we always have people who ask us questions like, can I choose my own doctor? And the answer is yes, within those limits. Am I right about that, That's Pat? correct. So um, once you have established a claim that you've been injured at work and you're given the notice and they get to a doctor for treatment, this treatment can literally go on for a lifetime, can't it? It can, yeah. and, and oftentimes it does. I have clients that have called me 20, 25 years later um, after they've come to see me, they've forgotten, they haven't seen a doctor in seven years, they've, their back's hurting again. They say, I need to go see my doctor again. We'll then contact the other attorney that was on the case or the workers' comp company and get that client back to see their treating physician again. And then you go from there, don't you? Yeah. Um, just as a side, I had a case a couple of years ago where a guy lost part of his leg. And when that happened, um, they wanted to come in after three or four years you have a new prosthesis put on every five to seven years mm -hmm. they wear out and they're real expensive fifty sixty seventy thousand dollars and they wanted to do a lump sum settlement now i know what your answer would be i know what my answer would be no we're not going to do that because he's a, this guy was in his 30s he's got a lifetime of of medical equipment he's going to have to uh, to purchase have you had that happen yes and what you're talking about is closing your future medical benefits right when you try to settle a workers' comp case, or when you're, you're, every workers' comp case is usually ordered to be mediated by the judge. And during mediation, the defense lawyer that represents the workers' comp insurance company is going to propose that your future medicals be closed and that they pay you a lump sum to close those. I usually would recommend to my client no, except for two, two instances. One, where their spouse has insurance and they're covered under that but you got to understand there's no guarantee that spouse will continue working for that company that they get insurance from or continue to have insurance from that company or if that my client is receiving Medicare through Social Security Disability. In those two instances then I would I would say let's let's entertain it see how much they're gonna pay it may be worth our while to, to listen to that. And the only reason to do that, Pat, is because <clears throat> you are still going to get your medical benefits either through a Social Security disability or through your own That's insurance correct. plan. But so then, but then, if you if you're getting Social Security disability, you would you would do what's called a Medicare set aside. Yeah, so, let's let's get to that in just a minute okay. in our third segment. I know that's a really important topic. Uh, let's talk for a second about what kind of damages you can get. You've you've mentioned to us that uh, a claimant can get his medical bills paid, what else is available? Well, you're, you're, most clients are interested in how they're going to be compensated besides getting medical benefits. It depends on what kind of injury you have. If you have a scheduled injury to your hand, your fingers, your elbow, Let, let me your interrupt arm. you right there. Explain to our audience what a scheduled injury means. Scheduled injury is, is in the code. If you have an appendage, your leg, arm, feet, hands, legs, stuff like that, you can only get a certain number of weeks compensation. So if you lost your leg, if your leg was cut off, you could only get 200 weeks of workers' compensation for that, for that leg. And that's not enough, but that's all you can get. Unless we can get out of the schedule and make it a body as a whole case, and that's where it gets really tricky. The, your shoulder case, your neck, and your back is a body as a whole case and you are entitled to 300 weeks of workers' comp for that unless you're totally disabled. And if you're totally disabled, you get workers' comp for the rest of your life. Yeah, and that can be a lot of money. It could be, yes. Which one of the rare circumstances where that's the case. Uh, what else are you, can you, uh, are you entitled to once you prove a, you're, you've got a workers' comp claim? Well, besides... Let's talk about the weekly benefit, for example. Yeah, the weekly benefit, the weekly benefit in Alabama is only $220. Maximum. Yeah, but if you, until you reach what's called maximum medical improvement, and this gets kind of tricky, until the doctor releases you and says you've, you're as good as you're going to get, you are entitled to TTD benefits, which is two-thirds of your average weekly wage. TT being temporary total, total disability? disability. Yeah. Okay. So if you're making $600 a week, you would get $400 
TTD benefits, which would be much more than the 220 cap. Until you're released to go back to work. Yes, that's correct. And let's just talk about that for a second. How do you prove temporary total disability? I mean, we, we, we talked on the show many times, it's up to the plaintiff to prove his damages, to prove his case, to satisfy a court or a judge or a jury you, that you're entitled. But in the case of workman's comp, how do you prove it? Well, that's a good question. You got, and, and you can't just say I got hurt, and the company got to run, run a, uh, go ahead and just write you a check. Yeah. You have to prove it through the through the doctor. Usually, your doctor is going to have to say number one that the problems that you presented him with is consistent with being hurt on the job, and then he's got to say how extensive the problem is. He could say that you're able to go back to work at a certain say light work or medium work or heavy work or he could say that he doesn't think you can go back to work at all so really it's going to depend a lot on what the physician the treating doctors states your problem is yeah you you make your case through the physicians yes that's correct what about a um someone who's an expert on vo a vocational expert do you use those some yes all the time all right tell us talk to us a little bit about what their what their role is in these well, cases. once you take the doctor's deposition and you you've established that one he was hurt on the job and what his functional problems are, then you get a vocational expert. Because the two things, the two most important things in a worker's comp case is what is your average weekly wage, because the higher your average weekly wage, the more money you're going to get, and what is your vocational disability. Okay, we're going to have to stop right there. We're on another break. When we come back in the third and final segment, we'll leave, we'll pick up yeah. where you left off, and it's an interesting topic, so stay tuned and we'll talk about that in just a few, couple of minutes. Yeah. Uh, welcome back to the third segment of tonight's show uh, on Fight for Justice. I am again Arthur Fight. I practice law here in Anderson and I have a special guest on this show, Pat Hughes, who also practices here in Anniston. Spends a lot of his practice in the workman's compensation area and that's what we've been talking about. When we left off the last segment, we we're talking about when it's appropriate to use a vocational expert to uh, prove your case. You still have to prove your case. As Pat said earlier, you can't just go into court and say, I'm hurt, and I think I'm permanently hurt. That won't go anywhere. So you got to have the doctor and the vocational expert. Pat, leave, let's go back to the vocational expert. Tell us, we didn't, I didn't ask you this question, but what is a vocational expert? A vocational expert is, is a person that, that is usually is educated in uh, social work, uh, does a lot of vocational training, and ha has a good understanding of what jobs are out there and can determine what jobs are out there based on your client's injuries. And what you use a vocational expert is to determine vocational disability or the way the Alabama code says, loss of earning capacity. So let's assume, for instance, um, I had a case in Clay County last year. I had a gentleman that was a supervisor at a company and had five back surgeries. So after every back surgery, he would go back to work and after the fifth surgery, he wasn't able to work anymore. Well, my vocational expert determined that he was 100% vocationally disabled or had a 100% loss of earning capacity, meaning there were no jobs he could do. He was 51 years old. He had a, um, I think he had a less than high school education, and we ended up selling that case. It was a fairly prominent case. It was a good case. Well, anytime you have a permanent, 100% permanent disability, you the value of the case is going to be significant That's correct. and improve. But going back down to the average worker, let's say, and they've all heard that you get six, six and two thirds of a weekly wage, wage rate. How long does that normally last? Well, it lasts until the doctor says that, that they have reached what's called maximum medical improvement. Once they reach maximum medical improvement, their, their TTD stops. And that is usually when we end up filing a lawsuit at that point, or contacting the, the employer and say, let's, let's see if we can get this case settled. Sometimes if you've dealt with the company before, you pretty well know you're not going to be able to settle it, so you just go ahead and file suit. Now, in most of these workman's comp cases, it's a matter of appreciation of the damages that are done and the value put on those, some by the code, weekly benefits, uh, but a lot, where's the gray area in trying to figure out how much a case is worth? Well, a gray area really is trying to determine whether or not your client is 100% disabled or not. So the, 
you know, just because your expert says that your client is 100% disabled, they're going to hire, the other side is going to hire an expert too. And mm -hmm. that expert's going to say 40% or 50, but I can guarantee you it's not going to say 100 <laughs> no. because they're trying to save money. So you need to, you, you've got to understand how, it's, how the, the chess game that you have with the other side is played. You cannot get lost wages in a workers' comp case, and you can't get um, pain and suffering, which you could in a, in a car accident case where, you know, if you had a Coca-Cola truck that ran a red light that has millions of dollars in insurance, you would be, and you, you were badly hurt, you could get lost wages if you couldn't work, and you could get pain and suffering, which you can't get in a workers' comp case. So what you're trying to do is maximize the facts that you have in your case through the doctor's deposition and also your vocational expert to try to get as much disability as you can for your client or as high disability ready as you can. So a lot of it's negotiated and it's that's, not that's strictly correct. by the statute. Yes. Uh, let's talk about death cases, people killed on the job. How about what's the value in that code on that? It's um, 500 weeks of workers' comp benefits in a death case. And that's it? That's it. So typically what would the award be? It depends on what the client's average weekly wage is. Yeah, suppose it's a thousand dollars. Well, I'd have to calculate that. But it be five hundred weeks times yeah, a thousand. That's That'd correct. be a half a million dollars. Yeah. I can do that math. That sounds. That's good, and, Arthur. And, and, you're and, you're, you're yeah. smarter than I am. <laughs> I don't know about that, <laughs> but it's not much money for a life. A half no, a million dollars. No, it's not. Dollars. I mean, you know, that that's. Uh, and, and and a lot of times you're talking about what the value of a life is. It's not a value of a leg or a value of a, a hurt mm -hmm. back or. Unless you're 100% disabled, you're not going to receive money that's, that compensates you totally for your injury. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. The, when's the last time that the benefits have been raised by the legislature? Thirty Over 30 years. So the benefits available today are kind of puny in yeah, many cases. Yeah, we're probably cases. the lowest southern state, southern state in the amount of benefits awarded. Let me guess what the reason for that is. Can you, can you tell us what your opinion is, why it's so low here? I don't know, Arthur. You're probably smarter than I am. No, well, I think it has something to do with politics and the employers trying to keep the benefits down. You're, you're so correct. the cost of their insurance premiums will not be raised. That's correct. Raised. That's, that has a lot to do with but it. But it's, yes. it's obviously it's way a It's a political game, and the employees do not have a lot of pull in, in Montgomery at this time. Now, let's, let's go back to a subject you raised earlier about the involvement of Social Security and, and in, the, in the interplay of that with settling a workman's comp case. Well, Talk. a lot of my clients are, are either either already determined to be disabled by Social Security or are, have a case pending. The only way that you're not, you're going to be able to, let's say you're getting $1,200 Social Security benefits a month. If you have a worker's comp case, the only way you can continue to, to protect that $1,200 a month is if you settle for a lump sum. If you settle for a lump sum, we can put the language in the settlement that will protect that so you can get a lump sum workers' comp and, a, and continue to get your Social Security. Let's say you don't. You'd say you go to court. Mm -hmm. any, any award that your client gets in court is going to be paid out weekly, whether it's 100 percent, 40 percent, 60 percent, and that's going to directly, off come, directly take away that amount of money from your Social Security benefits. So, for example, if your Social Security benefits are $1,000 a week, make it easy, and your benefit under Workman's Comp is $500 a week, you lose the $500 mm -hmm. of that Social That's Security correct. benefit. And you don't want to do that. No, you, you don't. Can keep so when it. I'm talking to my clients and we're, we're, we're in a mediation, what I will do, I will put two lines here. One is the, so, the amount of Social Security they're going to make the rest of their life on their disability claim and how much they're going to make on the workers' comp because those are directly involved with each other. And you've got to, my, part of what I'm trying to do is also protect my client's Social Security disability benefits too. All right, one last area I'd like to ask you about. <clears throat> Employers do have defenses to these workmen's compensation claims. That's true. But one, one that comes to my mind is where an employee has violated a company rule. That's true. And when that occurs, what happens to his claim? Well, if he's directly violated a rule, then he's he's pretty he's he's got a tough road to hoe. He might not win that case. That's correct. Are there any other defenses that are typically used that come to mind besides that one? Well, there's let's say if you you got in a in a 
in a fight or altercation with, a, with an employee. And you recently had a case on that. I have you? a case right now going on right now where my client was badly injured. Oh, we got about a minute. Still talk about that. Well, the cases in, in the cases are pretty well split on that. So we're going to, you usually have a fight to prove that that's, that's, that's a compensable injury. So, you know, it, it, the way it works is the worse your injury is, the better chance you have of at least obtaining some kind of settlement. And it, it's obviously got to rise on the place of employment. It can't occur out in the ball no, field. No, it has to be at the place of the place of employment. If you and I would work for the same company and we went to the ballpark and you beat me up, that that's not going to be compensable. Well, I'm not going to try to beat yeah, you. Don't up. do that, Arthur. Don't do that. <laughs> All right, we have about 20 seconds left. Uh, Pat, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. I'm glad to be here. I enjoyed um, it. Think it's going to be useful to our audience to hear this and know what they've got to do and what they can get in a workman's complication case. So pay, stay tuned next week for sports officials, the rules. We're going to talk about that. I think I'll, I'll watch that. Okay, good. <laughs>